All right. Um, so yeah, I'm Georgia, and you know, I when I got asked to keynote this, I thought you know I would give a talk about you know maybe you know how I felt about security or the community or whatever, and then Jason Street, who is not here, he's at I guess Gurkhan now, um, called me and said he was going to do that last week at Skydog Con. And I just assumed that Adrian Crenshaw was going to be filming it so it would be out and everyone would have seen it so there was no point. Plus, I guess Chris Nickerson gave that talk yesterday too, so I'm kind of glad I didn't bother to write it. So, okay, obviously I'm not funny because that's about as funny as it's going to get right there. Um, so, number one, I really hate these slides. They were actually written, well, me and a business person wrote them together and after spending some time in the business world, I think I may like be allergic to the business world after it, so I'm not sure. You know, I kind of came up in the security community, right? I mean, I know you guys, a lot of you guys are more developer focused, which, you know, having built a product now and then had a developer leave and then stuff stop working, I have a lot more respect for you guys now. Um, like. People who do secure development, like you're the coolest people ever. And if you want a job that pays absolutely no money, come talk to me. I also am out of business cards. Um, I went to an event last week and realized I was out of business cards, but then forgot about it. So I'm obviously not a business person at all. All right, so let's kind of talk about like, I guess the future of security, the way I see it. Maybe I'm just kidding myself because I feel like I've been saying this for a long time. And yet, you know, other security people are still like, what does your product do again? Burn. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, this talk is t basically it's 10 years since the iPhone 1 came out. Um, has security ca caught up? That was a catchy business title. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about like enterprise cybersecurity, you know, which is so far removed from any form of security I had ever seen in the security community. You know, in the security community, we're all about, okay, here's this thing, and we busted it, and we ran all around the enterprise, and, you know, all this stuff. But then, you know, you actually go to a real enterprise, and they're like, yeah, we have to check this box that said we did security. And so that's your enterprise security. So realizing that that's what I'm up against and that's, you know, you guys as developers are probably up against as well, you know, has really, I don't know, kind of made me have a nervous breakdown in a way that, you know, maybe security isn't that cool after all. Um, so, you know, we'll talk about, you know, the modern reality, the risks we're now faced with and what we're going to do about it or, you know, at least what I'm trying to do about it, what I think we should do about it. You know, as developers, as security professionals, as business people, you know, what we're going to do with this, like, new idea of the enterprise that is, you know, I go to a lot of, like, pitch events now. I'm not used to speaking for 50 minutes anymore. I speak for seven minutes. I say, my company is awesome, and here's some made-up numbers about revenue that doesn't exist. Invest in us. Like, that's what I say. And that's great, right? Um, well, sort of. Um, but I go to these pitch events and there's other security companies there and they all say basically our product or our service or our this or our box or our app, you know, or what have you, if you install it, it's going to solve all your security problems. And I see this as a security person and I'm like, but that, there's no way you can solve all of the security problems. I don't believe that that exists. The Wynn Schwartz out was telling me this stuff about like math, like calculus and differential equations and stuff that like theoretically solved all of security. So I'll give him that. He's a lot smarter than me. But in general, I think in terms of like solving the enterprise risk, the device risk, the application risk, I don't think that it's coming anytime, you know, in my lifetime per se. Um, <coughs> so I. You know, I see these products and these services, and you know what the real problem is? What's really got my beef is that they keep getting one client's to investment. And I understand why, because why would you want to like invest in a security program where you have to keep investing more and more stuff and time and effort on things that don't actually seem to give you any payback whatsoever? when you could just put this box on your network and then magically all your problems go away. And this is, I think, how these 
big breaches are happening deep down. I don't think it's people, you know, just being stupid like we in the community like to say, oh, those people didn't patch. I think the real issue is that we've got security companies saying we can fix all your security problems. They buy the box. I assure you that all those big breaches had every one of those big shiny boxes who told them they no longer needed to patch their systems. They no longer needed to do password management or anti-phishing behavior awareness or whatever. I should know this. Behavior management, I guess, is the word. And thus they thought they were safe, and that's what their vendors told them. So why should they not believe it? And that's why they got breached, just because they weren't doing their in-depth security program, because their vendors told them they didn't need to, that their boxes would solve all the problems. But then it gets a little bit more complicated. OK, let's say just for like, you know, I'm a penetration tester by, you know, that was my first job. That's kind of what I still do to pay the bills when everything else sucks. Um, and, you know, I break into the enterprise all the time. You know, I know you've got shitty passwords. I know that you've got like Windows XP. I saw it at the Dallas airport on the way over here, actually. You know, I know you've got missing patches. I know you've got, you know, old database stuff. I know you've got it. You know, I know I can break into your internal enterprise. Just forget about it. And if any of you guys do penetration testing or application security testing, you probably feel the same way. You know, everything you test has like cross site request forgery or it has like, you know, stored cross site scripting that turns into, you know, session hijacking. You know, you're just seeing this stuff over and over and over again. And it's like, why do I even bother? But it just got way more complicated and not just, I mean, it has been for a while. But I mean, typically when I, you know, whether it's, you know, me going in directly um, to a client, you know, I'm a small company, you know, I don't, you know, exactly get everyone's attention per se, or, you know, subcontracting through a bigger company, you know, however it is, you know, I end up working with a company. I mean, ultimately this picture, which is totally stolen from Cisco, which you probably realized from the blue boxes, this is what people want to test. They want to test this idea of a, a network. And you know, there may be like, you know, you can't, well, I mean, I certainly can't read it because I don't have my glasses on. That's like my trick for not being nervous is that I actually can't see you now at all. Um, <laughs> as I take my glasses off before I speak. But this is, this is the network, right? It might be like offsite places and things and whatnot. But it's like this flat idea of a network. It's flat idea of, you know, we can monitor the network, especially troubling is that we can watch the perimeter. I mean, a very high percentage of our security is put at the perimeter. I mean, yeah, there's some endpoint stuff now that, you know, has varying rates of success of actually solving anything. You know, you probably, you know, saw the thing at DEF CON, Black Hat, where, you know, they said that, like, Silent stops Mimikatz, and then somebody put Mimikatz on the computer that was doing that demo. Um, and Silas did, in fact, not catch it. Um, so, you know, there are host-based products, certainly, but a lot of our security is still being kept at the perimeter. And, you know, we have this idea that all of our security stuff needs to be at the perimeter because all of our data has to cross the perimeter. Like, before we get data loss, it has to cross, you know, our firewall, our intrusion detection system, whatever our controlled perimeter is. The problem is that's not really the case anymore. Um, you look at, say, you know, this thing that's got, you know, a shattered screen and, you know, I've got a couple more of them in my bag and tablets and, you know, even some of the laptops now and, uh, you know, your smartwatches. I saw somebody get on the plane with their smartwatch. I, I really didn't know you could do that. It doesn't really surprise me, but it was funny at the time. It seemed like, you know, just like slapping your wrist. I thought he had an implant for a minute. You know, you see those people in security who like open their door, their RFID doors with an implant. But it was actually just his watch. But anyway, you've got all your car, certainly, if you've got one nicer and newer than mine, you know, mine doesn't, mine's not vulnerable to anything except, you know, maybe not turning on. But uh, I mean, most of your newer cars basically have a phone inside of them um, to call home. And you know, those sorts of things don't really cross the perimeter. And that's where having you know, all of your security sitting at the perimeter becomes a problem. And it's not just you know, a mobile problem, per se. I mean, you're also looking at 
Now, I'd like to say, though it was a reporter that gave me this idea because he asked me the question, um, you know, he was asking about mobile and then he asked about cloud and he asked if like cloud services were basically the same thing and it was like, yeah, I totally put them in the same like bank account, the mobile and the cloud issues because once again, it's outside of your perimeter. I mean, you're getting on salesforce.com, you're getting on social media, you're getting on, you know, all these other sites um, that you, you know, you've got Jira, you've got whatever it is that like build stuff that I always forget about. Um, Jenkins, that's it, see. Becoming a DevOps person, but not very quickly. So you've got all these ways that your enterprise data is potentially missing that perimeter entirely. So you've got you know, your mobile modems, you've got near field communication for like payment stuff, you've got um, Bluetooth, you've got you know, it going up into web applications for cloud services, you've got you know, it wandering around the globe. You know, this is just Austin, but you know, people go to China and Russia and other places that you know, the network infrastructure may not necessarily be so nice. Um, so you've got all these possibilities where you know, this doesn't really hold up anymore, and yet this is the kind of security testing we're doing. You talk to you know, pretty much like any pen test shop, vulnerability assessment shop, anything, and you know, they're looking at what are your vulnerabilities on your Windows boxes, your Linux boxes, your Wi-Fi, um, can we break into your Wi-Fi, can, are your passwords insecure, MSO8067, Eternal Blue, but we're totally missing all of these issues and you know it's not a complete picture of enterprise security without it. Um, you know it makes I guess a good report to say that yeah we popped you know your all your systems because we popped you know this old box that was in a corner that you forgot about that wasn't patched and that got us onto your domain and then we got domain admin but then when you fix those problems you know you've still got these problems and you know I know it is a good question to say that you know if we can't fix like MSO 8067 or you know now eternal blue if we can't fix that how are we going to fix this so maybe I'm overreaching here about like what we're capable of as a security industry but I'm at least trying to help so you know I have this kind of idea of the threat model of mobile and it's a lot like a traditional device. I mean, you think, you know, laptop or desktop, you've got, you know, your remote exploits, you know, the super duper MSO8067, Eternal Blue, the really scary stuff. Though you've got a lot more like client side exploitation. You've got a lot more, you know, somebody has to open something nasty in their browser or their PDF viewer or, you know, in this case, in an application like Maps or again, a PDF viewer. Um, then certainly you've got you know the idea of you know social engineering. We'll talk more about social engineering later. You know I've always kind of ragged on social engineering as like you know what people who aren't real aren't cool enough to write exploits do. But having been in security for longer now, I realize that that's a really dumb way to look at it. Um, since you know social engineering works so well. Um, so yeah, we'll talk a little more about that later, but certainly I think the phishing issue on mobile is worse than ever, and once again, we have completely failed to stop phishing on email. It's the number one way that people get attacked is through some sort of email phishing vector, and now with mobile, we've got all of these additional ways that people can be phished, so Again, maybe it's just too hard of a problem to solve. I don't know. Welcome to my security nervous breakdown. Can we solve this problem at all? But the real problem with mobile, I think, you know, all of, and when I say mobile, again, I'm thinking, you know, all of the, the tablets and things as well, the IoT devices, I kind of, you know, lump them all together. The problem is that they're just a little bit too secure for the old paradigm to work. Um, because again, I mean, I made the joke about silence and mimi cats, but you know, these these host-based malware detection, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, threat detection, you know, whatever they want to call themselves today, whatever the buzzword is that people are buying, you know, they do, you know, provide a service. My mom loves to download online games. I don't know where the hell she gets them from, but she's always got this new game and 
every time I end up looking at our computer, it's just like a complete disaster of malware. Like, not the super scary, hard industrial malware, but like the kind of stuff that an antivirus program would catch. And it does catch, you know, she's got the, the McAfee or, or whatever. I don't know which vendor she's got. But anyway, you know, it pops up and it says, you know, this is bad. Um, so, I mean, those things do provide value. The problem is that, you know, they basically took that exact same model. And why not? Because really, this is the one thing I had to learn from moving from being basically just a security researcher who was doing this to get on stages and be famous and be on television to you know being a business person that the real goal is not to be cool the real goal is to make money right so if people are going to buy it who cares if it doesn't work um, all you have to do is convince them that it will so I totally understand why you know when mobile became a thing it was like okay let's take all of the security stuff that we had on traditional devices like you know a Windows PC or a Mac or what have you and let's put them on phones let's put them on tablets and then when IOT started happening let's put them on IOT too because then you know you've got one person with a laptop but then they've got a phone and a tablet too or maybe they've even got two phones because they've got a corporate one and a personal one look at all that extra licensing so I totally understand why like every host detection thing ever made a mobile version for both Android and iPhone and for a while Windows Phone and Blackberry as well but not so much now but the problem is that basically the phone architecture is just secure enough that it makes that stuff useless. You know, we're used to being able, you know, on the Windows machine, you know, to this day, you know, in administrator mode, you know, we can scan and look for viruses and things. We can look for things that look weird. We can look for things in memory, whatever. Um, you know, it can run, you know, in the kernel. You can't really do that on a phone or any mobile device really, um, you know, without like jailbreaking or rooting, which, you know, causes its own set of yes and no's. Um, so basically, really, the only way I think to solve like mobile security problem is it's gonna have to be baked into the device itself, which, you know, you guys are developers, right? I mean, it's, you know, basically like a rule of thumb that you don't test your own stuff. You know, it's true in security. I know it's true in development as well, because no matter how smart you are, it's like, you know, proofreading your, you know, I wrote, oh, I was supposed to talk about that. Right, okay, so there's two copies of my book that are in the silent auction, and they're signed, and usually I, like, throw them off the stage, but apparently you kind of get in trouble for that, because it's like a fire hazard or something. So you have to do the, the auction, but it's, you know, for a great cause. So there are two of them, so if you want to learn about penetration testing, how did I get on that? Oh, right. So if you're like proofreading your own book, no matter like how smart you are at grammar, you won't be able to find your mistakes. It's kind of the same thing. But, and I mean, there's vendors that are trying to do this. I mean, you've got Samsung Knox, you've got, um, you know, Apple tries to do a lot like baked in, certainly with security. I mean, I'm not saying that, I'm actually saying that the security of the devices is great. I'm just saying that the security of the devices is not and never will be perfect. Um, as with any other device, there's always going to be vulnerabilities. There's always going to be social engineering vectors where the user is able to undermine the security. Um, but I mean, in the worst case, you've got a security app on the device that periodically wakes up and asks itself whether it's a virus and then goes back to sleep. You think I'm kidding? I'm really not. That's like what a lot of them do. Apple actually kicked a lot of uh, like antiviruses off their store um, for this reason because they realized that you know they weren't actually able to do their job with the mobile architecture. Um, so you know that's and yet you know people are still buying it. So you know who cares, right? Certainly they don't. I mean, I'd, it seems like the security vendors don't think that they actually have to do a good job. And why should they, as long as people keep buying? Um, but, I mean, never have we seen devices that are quite so connected. I mean, you know, I'm not that old, but, like, you know, I remember, like, you know, when I was young, it was, like, you know, the AOL and whatever, and, you know, you've got the, like, modem thing singing, and it takes forever um, to log on. 
Um, and then, you know, then you get wireless internet and then you don't trip over the damn cord anymore. And it's like, this is exciting. But of course, people that are older than me, like remember like punch cards and things. Um, so I should probably not make jokes about like fast internet around, you know, people who might be a little older than me. Actually, I have no idea because again, I can't see. Um, but never have there been devices that are, are so connected. And again, you know, kind of going back to this idea of like, the stuff we're doing with these devices now and the stuff we think is a good idea. Like again, when I go to like pitch contests, it's not always all security people. Sometimes it's like, you know, I'm gonna make your phone like into your doctor and I'm gonna make people be able to diagnose you like through this case that ha it will like take your blood pressure and it'll do all the, and it'll like take your blood. And I'm just like, what? And people think this is a great idea and absolutely in the name of progress, let's totally forget about the security issues and just absolutely make everything as scary as humanly possible, this device. Like, you know, every time it comes out and people are so enraged that like, oh, your television is spying on you. And it's like, yeah, who didn't see that coming? Come on. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess privacy is dead, but like seriously, this thing in your pocket or this thing, you know, in your car or this thing in your home, if you think about it, it's fucking scary. Like really, in terms of the amount of data it is able to see and process and, you know, send off site without telling you. Um, it speaks all these different languages. I mean, I guess everybody knows that, you know, Google Maps and all these places like keep all your old GPS coordinates um, so they know everywhere that you've been. I mean, I've always said it would be a really great time to break into my house now because um, I'm not there. Um, you know, naturally they speak Wi-Fi, cellular, um, near field communication, um, uh, Bluetooth, you know, all these other and power adapters as well. I mean, I guess, you know, this had its day as well that like power adapters can be malicious, but now, you know, with like in the airport, I see like these charging stations and they've got like every adapter imaginable and you like give them money and they charge your device. And I'm just like, eh, I gotta put out some of those. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta put out some of those and see what I get. You know, I, I, I'm always just too good of a person. Like, you know, I see all these like malware authors and stuff making a lot of money and I'm like totally broke all the time. And I'm like, if I could just go bad for just like a few days, <laughs> write something that wasn't completely shitty, put it out there, make some money, and then be, go back. Like, it would be okay. I could use that to finance my company. How is that for like non-dilutive funding? Okay, I see what it takes to make you guys laugh. <laughs> All right, and then it gets worse because then you get this like ecosystem because they said that like all the host space stuff moved on to mobile so they could get more licenses. Well, all of the like network based stuff did too naturally. You know, we, we first we got this thing called mobile device management really and there's slides for all of this. And then they changed their name to enterprise mobility management without basically changing anything at all. It was like, I guess Gartner came up with something else that MDM stood for, like mid-range data, whatever. You'd have to look it up. Um, yeah, Gartner Magic Quadrants was a real like eye-opening experience to me that you could basically pay to have someone say that your security product was awesome. And that was all you had to do. And then everybody, when they're like, okay, let's go get some security products, they get the Gartner Magic Quadrant, and it's like, what's in the top right? And it's like, oh, the people who paid to be there. I give up, guys. I give up. <laughs> like, if this is what security is, I'm going to go do something else, seriously. But anyway, you know, you've got your mobile app stores on site, and you've got your enterprise mobility management, and you've got your, you know, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention that now, you know, say that they're also looking for things for mobile. You know, your vulnerability assessment kind of tools. <laughs> say they are too, but again, they're, they're generally sitting at the perimeter and listening on the wire. So unless, you know, your attacks happen to be going over Wi-Fi, which if I was a sophisticated attacker is not what I would do with a device that can do all these other things that aren't being monitored at all, you know, that's not what I would do. But again, you know, I'm not an attacker, but 
obviously I'd be a pretty good one if I did. So, I mean, we've also got this entire mobile ecosystem. And yes, all of those things are on the domain too. So when you are doing your penetration test and you get your domain admin credentials, yes, you can log into all these boxes too. Just, you know, as a side note, if any of you guys do penetration testing, yeah, once you get your domain admin, you've got, you know, mobile capabilities as well by logging into these things, which have, you know, access to the devices. So anyway, just a side note. Um, so I said we talk a little bit more about social engineering. And again, I have always kind of like given the finger to social engineering. I thought it was lame. Naturally, I would do it when my customers wanted it, you know, Metasploit Pro or FishMe or, you know, whatever vendor and, you know, send it out and get it done. And here's the people who clicked on this really stupid thing I sent you that basically says, hey, this is a phishing email. Do not click on this. 95% success rate. What do you do with something like that? Like, if the only way we have to deal with social engineering issues is by doing security training and we do security training and then we send out a message that says this is a phishing email don't click on it and we still get okay maybe like 95 success was a high but I mean we get a fair number of people who still click the link I just because I mean that's a really like simple test I mean certainly there there is no one in the world, well, okay, no one in the world, like no one in the connected world of, you know, IT that you could not write a social engineering campaign that wouldn't get them. Basically, my, uh, one of my uh, guys who does PR for me sometimes said a really good quote, and I wrote it on the inside of a bus once. Um, <laughs> that actually makes sense. I, I did this thing, it was called Road Trip Nation, and they did like students trying to learn cybersecurity and they had this big green bus that they let me drive and I kind of wrecked it. But like they had all the people that they interview write something and I wrote links are meant to be clicked because they are, that's kind of the point, right? Links are meant to be clicked. So oh, I guess I hit back and now I hit two forward. There we go. All right, so like I said, there's no way that, that I mean, I would certainly fall for it. I mean, I think about it, you know, and it's like, oh, you got to sign this, like, document or else you're not going to get paid or something like that, you know, DocuSign or something. But it's like, you know, what are you going to do? You need the money. you got to sign the document. So naturally, you know, you open it. It opens in your, like, browser PDF viewer extension, which, you know, no doubt, you know, as they say with, like, WebKit, it's basically, you know, a, a backdoor with... Uh, a rendering function. Uh, all right, that's not funny. Um, but then, uh, you know, with mobility, we get all these other ways that people can be social engineered beyond email. But even with email, I mean, you think about like what people learn in, you know, security awareness training. They learn like hover over the link or, uh, you know, make it make its like real link or, you know, all these things that you're supposed to do which, how do you do that on an Android or an iPhone? Or You don't. Um, so, you know, it really doesn't line up. Um, and then, you know, you've got text message. You know, we're starting to see, you know, some, certainly in the wild we're seeing it, and certainly a little bit um, from some of the assessments. Um, we're seeing text message, social engineering attacks. Um, but there's also, you know, all these other ways, like QR codes, like at RSA this past year, you had to like scan a QR code to get in. Um, QR codes are finally taking off. Like in one of the assessments that I did, um, I'm allowed to say this, they were a reference pilot, um, but basically um, they shared a building with, uh, I guess it was Avon Payne um, downtown in DC. So we made like a poster that was a discount coupon for Avon Payne and put it in their break room and it had a QR code on it. And sure enough, people were glad to scan it and even download our application that had some, you know, extra features um, to get their, you know, $5 off or whatever um, by scanning the QR code because, you know, it looks like that. Who knows where it goes? Um, and then, you know, you've also got all these different messengers, um, you know, WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, all the Facebook, Twitter, DM, 
you know, and especially, you know, ones like WhatsApp and, and uh, Telegram and these that, you know, claim themselves to be secure. I think a lot of people take their security awareness down a level because they're expecting a certain level of security. But if you're able to send, again, a link of some kind for people to click on, it becomes entirely, you know, the same situation. Steal people's credentials, install stuff on their system, exploit them through client-side attacks what have you, you know, the same sorts of things that are working so successfully through, you know, traditional email attacks against traditional devices. Now you've just got all these other ways that people are not being trained, so your, you know, success rate goes up and up. And then, I guess the, <coughs> the real question comes in, like, what is the impact of all this? Like, who cares if you get on my phone? Like, Okay, you get to steal my pictures from last night at the speaker party, which I guess the speaker party was the night before. I don't know. I didn't even go. I wasn't here yet. I was on an airplane yesterday. So you get to steal my pictures. You get to steal my personal stuff, what have you. Okay, you maybe you get to like steal corporate emails, location information, like who cares? I mean, you can also control the device. Because, you know, when you get a text message from, like, number 1234, you might not click on it, but if it actually comes from your boss's number or your IT director's number or someone you're used to getting, you know, say, two-factor authentication text messages from, um, if you're used to that, um, you're much more likely um, to click on it naturally um, so you can, you know, attack the chain of trust um, by, you know, once you get on somebody's device, um, you can certainly make that device do things for you. Um, you know, I have on here post on Twitter. Um, you know, I guess, you know, this is kind of an old slide deck because, you know, our president has proved that nothing you write on Twitter will actually ruin your reputation. <laughs> so I take it back. Um, posting on Twitter will not ruin the reputation of your company um, entirely. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's just a president thing. I don't know record video or audio of the user and send it off site. I mean, this is, again, it's just, you know, you see the, you know, the, f the uh, webcam on the Mac, you know, it getting hacked and then, you know, people posting videos of, you know, their Trojan computers um, that they've hacked, you know, same thing on the mobile devices. Um, you know, this gets scary when I think that, you know, executives and such, you know, start to take this seriously. You know, they actually listen to me for two seconds you know, when I say that, because, you know, they have, you know, closed door meetings and they have their mobile devices with them. Um, but, you know, if someone, if the wrong people were listening, you know, insider trading and all that. Um, certainly privilege escalation, because, you know, as we, you know, looked at with, with this guy, you know, security is kind of baked into the device. Um, so being able to break out of, you know, whatever security it has in terms of the you know, sandboxes with the mobile device management or, um, like on device stuff like Knox or you know whatever they have in terms of um, security being able to break out around it which you know again it comes back to the tr traditional device you know it's you know you come in as an unprivileged user you want to get you know root or administrator or kernel or whatever depending on the device same kind of thing here but where I think it gets really interesting is pivoting um, which it always, again, did with the traditional devices as well. You know, you get onto somebody's workstation and turn that into, say, domain admin or getting into the database with the credit cards or what have you. Same sort of deal um, with the mobile phones. I mean, a lot of places, they really just put, like, the, the uh, Wi-Fi password on the whiteboard. You might be surprised how many, like, you know, of medium-sized businesses do this. Um, you've got you know, a lot of your bigger companies are VPNing in, so that's, you know, a little bit more secure, but if, you know, I'm the, the root of the device and then now I can, you know, basically click go and VPN and, and get, you know, some access to the network. It really depends, you know, on the, the network in particular um, and how it's set up. Certainly if you've got, you know, like our first picture, basically, um, you know, this completely flat network, it would be a disaster to have a mobile device that has, you know, malware on it that is controlled by someone else that is inside of this network and can go wherever they want and no doubt find other vulnerabilities they can exploit to pivot around it and do the same thing you would do, you know, if you got somebody's workstation. 
Um, if you know the, the devices end up on their own network or some sort of guest network, certainly that's better. Um, but you've still got you know possibilities. I went way too far. Um, so naturally, we've got to fix this problem, and people realize that it's a problem, sort of. Um, so yeah, we're going to fix it. We talked a little bit about the mitigations already, but these are you know kind of what we're doing about you know this security issue. Um, right now, so we've got you know isolation, mobile device management. Like I said, mobile device management became enterprise mobility management with very little change at all. Mobile application management, which is currently, I guess, the gold standard of what you're supposed to do. And I mean, you guys are application developers. I mean, do you think you're ever going to be able to like make it so that a blacklist or a whitelist like ever works ever? I mean. I did this like interview with a reporter and it was I guess about like somebody had one of the like app testing companies naturally in their own interest they would put out like a report that said that like these are the apps that are bad that we block and it's like okay so you get rid of these like 10 apps what about the like 10,000 more that come to take their place tomorrow I just don't think it's something that works but anyway we'll talk about that and of course, our old favorite, you know, endpoint protection, our antivirus threat management, whatever. You know, it works with my mom's online games. All right, I went two slides. This is not working. Maybe I should not have kept this thing. All right, so system isolation. I mean, you probably saw a lot of this, you know, when BlackBerry was still cool. You know, people would have their, you know, Android and iPhone, or, and then they'd have their corporate BlackBerry. I mean, some people. People still do this. Um, you, know, you have your corporate phone that you have no rights to whatsoever. Um, it's purely for corporate. You're not allowed to do anything with it. You don't have admin on it or anything. You can't install anything on it. You absolutely hate it and drop it in the toilet. And then you've got your personal phone, um, but not many places do this anymore, except for governments do it a lot. Um, then you've got. Um, a lot more of what you see is like dual profile devices so it's you know the corporate owned personally enabled more you know letters to remember like c y o e or whatever um that was wrong p e um so that's you know what we're trying to do with Knox um and things like that and then i mean i can kind of tell you this because i won't go into any details and it wasn't me it was someone i used to work with that like worked on kind of like I guess what Blackphone was trying to do um, with the Android, um, except they were trying to do it like in the government, and they basically like had two different phones like inside of it, and it got to be about as big as like the T1 calculator, and it was really hot, and it kind of blew up. So it wasn't really. I mean, they still have stuff like this, but that was like the early model of the dual profile device, um, but. I mean, and I mean, it works with varying success. I mean, certainly, you know, if you can break out of your sandbox space or your, you know, memory protected space, you know, into the lower layers and then come back out on the other side, and there's always going to be a certain amount of risk with that, which was, I guess, why they were trying to literally make two different processors, two different memories, et cetera. I mean, that would be the gold standard, right? Where it's literally using different architecture, but since we, so I guess we seem to change what we want, right? It, we want it to be super, super small, and then we want it to be super big. Like it, I guess it's not us; it's the people who sell it to us. Um, and then, of course, you know, application isolation. So you've got your, you know, your work apps that are in, you know, a separate again sandbox space, which, again, you you know, break out of it. Um, which I'm always really surprised. Again, it's kind of like a business thing that it's like, you know, you talk to business people and they're like, man, I used to be such a fan of that, like, good or that this or, or you know, what what have you. And then, I, you know, then, then they're like, but then I heard that you could, like, pull the data straight out of memory, like, with an exploit. And it's like, yeah, somebody spoke about that at Black Hat, like, five years ago. But that's, I guess, our problem as a security industry is that I guess we have a PR problem that people, you know, yeah, we talk about it at our security conferences, but then it doesn't translate into, you know, actually solving enterprise security problems. Instead, people buy two phones or try and build a, a safer phone. And then, you know, again, people are like, all right, let's make some money off of this. Let's basically make a firewall. 
um, for mobile. So mobile device management was born. But really, the whole point of mobile device management, I realize, again, this is like from a business perspective, is because people had room in their budget for a BlackBerry Bez, the BlackBerry Enterprise server. So when the BlackBerry Enterprise server went away, they had like this line item. So this mobile device management basically came in to take that budget. Um, but you know, basically the idea was provisioning, um, <laughs> making it so that people could get their email on their phone and, and what have you without you know, having to take it down to IT and take time out of their day. So really, to this day, these things are typically bought by operations. They're not bought by security. So their security features are always going to be kind of like a second tier thing comparatively. Um, and you know it was you know shown as the case because while these would you know in varying amounts and you know to this day have security features, they would generally be you know pretty terrible. Um, you know you get like root detection that um, looks for on iPhone the Cydia app which if you jailbreak your phone yourself, you totally get the Cydia app because that's typically packaged with your you know, self-rooting and jailbreaking. You know, on the Android side, it's super user. But if you were a bad guy and you want to take over somebody's phone, get root level access, start exfiltrating data, not get noticed, like the last thing you would possibly want is a third party app store. I mean, they're really like overestimating these people here. I mean, underestimating, but Okay, we're almost done. So like I said, um, basically they had a name issue and they, wanted, they had gotten some flack again, like you know, in the security community and whatnot um, from people saying, you know, this stuff doesn't really provide security. So they rebranded themselves as enterprise mobility management. And now we do all these things like we have the corporate app store and we can, you know, block things that are scary on the device and blacklist and whitelist apps and all sorts of like scary stuff. But of course, we can still provision things. Um, so we can still make it so that you can get on the Wi-Fi and get your email without having to go to IT, which again was really the whole point. And again, these are still bought by ops, so that's really what they want. They really want to know what devices are here and be able to get them on the network. Again, there's varying degrees of you know, security capabilities. I mean, really the problem that I see is with the vulnerability assessment um, in mobile now is that they typically talk to these guys and say, okay, tell me the state of security, which since this guy's job is to secure mobility, if you ask it whether mobility is secure, that's like asking the night watchman who slept all night, like whether anybody broke in. So, you know, that's my problem with that. But, I mean, a lot of people have these things, certainly. I mean, it's a line item. It's been around since the Bez. Um, but, like I said, the gold standard right now is kind of mobile application management, um, either as part of a bigger enterprise mobility management or as a separate thing, um, which is the idea that your corporate apps live in a, a separate sandbox um, from your personal apps, um, so they're not able to communicate with each other, and thus, you know, the idea is if there's a malicious app in your personal device, it will not be able to get to into the sandbox, which you know certainly is kind of a ridiculous idea. But you know, like you know, my mom's online games, um, it'll get the easy stuff. It'll keep the easy stuff out. The really you know hard stuff, you know, the, the where people actually you know got access to whatever mobile application management system they've got and figured out a way around it and put payloads in it for that, you know, you'll get certainly stuff able to get around it. And again, it varies by vendor, like how good they are at keeping stuff out, but you know, there's always going to be a way around this stuff. Um, there's no way to make it completely secure in my mind. Um, the other problem with it is that people typically hate it. Um, you know, the people who built it are not typically app developers, so you get like their version of PowerPoint doesn't render stuff properly, or you get like not able to use your device properly. Like you get a meeting invite inside of your sandbox, and you know you're on your way to the meeting, and you click the the Maps address, and it wants to go to Maps, but Maps is in your personal sandbox, so they're not able to talk to each other and you know that makes people mad and when people at the sea level get mad security stuff tends to go away so then you've got you know endpoint stuff we've talked about this a lot already and I'm kind of running out of time um, 
you know, that this is, you know, the new antivirus and in the worst case, it basically asks whether itself is a virus. Really the only way to get around that would be for it to be baked, you know, into um, the, the architecture of the mobile. I mean, you see a lot of them um, on the Android side, they'll like come with Lookout or something, but it's still running in user land, so it's still not really able to do what we would even expect if a traditional antivirus, which we kind of make fun of as an industry on a more traditional computer, but it can certainly do a lot more than it can do on a mobile device where it's in a lot of cases basically just scanning itself. Um, so yeah, uh, most of your places that you're gonna be working with in the enterprise, they've got you know either some kind of enterprise mobility management, a mobile application management by itself, and then you know some sort of endpoint protection which isn't really solving the problem in my mind. Um, so, you know, mobile threats revisited now that we've talked about, you know, the ways to stop these things. Do any of the things that we just talked about, can they stop like, well, to some extent, malicious applications? Um, can it stop social engineering? No, not at all. Even on the iPhone, like there's this other talk I give, um, you know, a more technical, not keynotey one. Um, where I like show using profiles, which is what the enterprise uses to provision iPhones um, and iOS devices. And the user just has to say yes to like basically undo like all of security, which is how social engineering works. So, I mean, certainly stealing the device is even you know, more likely when they're this little, um, you know, people don't put passwords on them or they put, you know, 6969 is their password or something like that. So. I mean, in general, we have not so solved the mobile risk problem. It's even bigger than the traditional device problem, and we have completely failed to fix it by basically just retrofitting stuff that almost worked on traditional devices. So naturally, I would say this, because I'm a penetration tester, but what's missing is monitoring the risk, doing that vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, to find out one what your mobile risks are because they really are going to vary from enterprise to enterprise because nobody really has the same like mobile infrastructure these days even though it's 10 years old it's still you know kind of this new thing so those things that we can fix we can fix them you know find out what you know our problems are and fix them and you know if we're not able to fix them completely put you know some kind of additional mitigation like a better version of one of these guys um, to mitigate that risk. Um, and then, I mean, it's, we're seeing a lot more continuous monitoring, certainly, um, in just the vulnerability assessment space and penetration testing in general um, with the traditional devices. But, I mean, a lot of times, you know, you get like people who do, you know, their assessment once, they run, you know, whatever product once they have, and the consultants come in and do the pen test once and you know that's their standard um, for you know the security and then they come back a year later and yeah you fixed all those problems but you've literally not patched since which is not generally good um, duh. so I mean it's even worse with mobile um, because it's changing so rapidly people are getting you know so many different devices I mean I don't know about you but you know I kind of have like a, a shared workspace um, and you know, we've always got a lot of fun toys around and they're all you know internet enabled the tv is online the, all the toys are online all the you know since i do iot testing i have like literally everything you know those meeting schedulers are great i'm going to do a talk right about them next spring um but anyway so the point being you know somebody drops their phone in the toilet they get a new phone your risk profile of your enterprise has changed between Friday and Monday because they're bringing in that new device um, which has a different risk profile you know you see that you know even with the same device um, you know say it's whatever this is you know a couple versions back of the galaxy and you, know, you get you know somebody who bought it at Best Buy somebody who bought it straight from AT&T somebody who bought it you know off eBay used you've got three devices that in the enterprise mobility management look exactly the same as you know this device X at this you know version of Android at this baseband level etc in terms of what apps they come with what nasties they're you know already got on there you know it's very different per device so this is something you absolutely need to do like all the time 
in terms of like rinse and repeat because like I said you're just going to get more and more different devices and it's really scary and yeah so that's about it I guess so like I said there's like no cards I suck um, but I have theoretically some of my information up there I can't read it but hopefully you guys can like there's my Twitter and an email address for me and I know my company name is really hard to spell and say but it seemed like a good idea at the time and nobody's come up with anything better to change it with so yeah so welcome to my security nervous breakdown let's do it all over again um, so yeah I guess like the big picture thing is like Mobility is scary, and it cloud is mobility, and it's just going to get worse, and we're going to have to do something about it, and we've really got to do better security testing around devices that we're basically ignoring, because literally penetration testing and vulnerability assessment is all but ignoring these devices and just going after your workstations and servers. And that's no good for the state of security. So go buy the book or silent auction the book. So I couldn't throw it at you guys' heads. This probably wouldn't be good. So who's after me? <laughs>